tension between the end, what God gives in the gospel, and where we are right now then history comes into its own as something to be seri taken seriously and thoroughly temporal. That is, I'm looking at the future and I'm responsible for, um, for um, shaping that future in this world. Not the kingdom, but very, very um, in a penultimate sense. Um, what kind of life are, are my children gonna have? What kind of life will their children have? Um, what kind of a, a society are we going to have? And what powers and gifts and so on has God given me to use so that you live fully within time, responsibly? Now, this is the element of modernity that, that um, comes from the gospel. And, it, and, and of course, it gets dis cut off from the gospel and takes on a life of its own and becomes what I just described as autonomy. You know, we're not concerned. But, and, but, but also, then, it's constantly being tempted to, uh, again, make history sacral or sacred, as happened in, in uh, Bonhoeffer's time. Uh, when there were the big totalitarian schemes to bring in uh, a, a kind of a millennium uh, through revolution and the, create the new humanity in one way or another. Uh, and, and we know the evil that happened because of that. Yeah, Lene? Uh, Lene had a question. No, no I, oh, I'm sorry. No. That it is Jesus Christ that actually establishes the historical perspective by becoming the center of history, in mm -hmm. a sense. And so the people who want to say, uh, count our years in terms of before Christ and Anno Domini, mm -hmm. that's actually correct. And maybe you could even argue that before Christian era, after Christian era, it's, it's almost another attempt to, you know, to have history apart from God, just like it's an attempt to have morality apart from God, and uh, uh, another example of the world coming of age. Yeah, except that uh, all of this was already, the word was already implanted in the Old Testament. The word was already here because so, so, but certainly uh, now the end has come in Jesus Christ. So now, now we, um, uh, I mean, fu fully and finally when he's, when the crucified one is raised from the dead, which it's just, as you can see that this, what this is, is a restating of two kingdoms doctrine, right. trying to recover it in its true, uh, uh, in its truth, not, not this distorted form that was so disastrous in which they were utterly separated. He's trying to show the Christological basis of this doctrine. And he's, he's saying that um, it is uh, the resurrection of Jesus and the announcement of the gospel of Jesus Christ and God's new age breaking in right now as we hear that that at the same time opens up God's other world, this world, in all of its brokenness and fallenness, as also God's world, now not as the arena where we justify ourselves, but as the arena where, uh, we, where, where, where we go to our neighbor and live in our vocation in order, to, in order to preserve this world for its redemption in Christ, to be part of what God is doing in the world. 
So we are given this world. We don't grab this world directly, you know, as if we could have some insight into what God is doing there just directly by looking at what's happening in history around us. We come through the cross, and the cross is what gives us the world and its reality. So he called this, um, you know, the... Um, I can't... I can't uh, I've tried many times to diagram this, so I'll forget. I won't do it. If you, if you go to page three here, it says, the world come of age uh, can only be understood in terms of Bonhoeffer's distinction between the ultimate and the penultimate. So that's the last things. That's the last things, what, what the resurrection, which is given to us now in the gospel, in the promise. And, uh, and the penultimate, which is the uh, next to the last things. <laughs> and they are determined from the end. And it's from the end and from the light of the gospel that we can see this world in its reality. And um, that we are launched into this world in order to live in responsibility uh, for its future. Uh, we are living in the penultimate and believe the ultimate. That's the way he put it. So, um, so this is what I just said, but let me read this paragraph. The proclamation of justification in Christ opens up this world in all its ambiguity as God's good though fallen creation, where the tension between law and gospel, between sinner and saint, between this world and God's new world is not prematurely resolved, as in the authentic Lutheran Reformation, where it is not prematurely resolved, this world comes into its own. It is not sacred in any way. It is not sacred in the sense that the status quo uh, can be identified as God's order, nor is it sacred in the sense they were called upon to transform this world into God's new world. This world is simply this world and is to be taken seriously for its own sake. It is the arena of service, of responsible action. Therefore, we can take history seriously without making it sacred. We no longer stand above history in a realm of timeless values, but are really immersed in history. We become truly temporal, contemporary with those around us. That's what Bonhoeffer is getting at. Okay, so do you think this is a plausible uh, account of the root cause of modernity? What do you think? Is this plausible? Do you think it really comes from the gospel? Well, yeah. Why? Mm -hmm. And there's no sense of, of uh, temporal. I mean, there's no sense of a beginning and an end mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's a mm -hmm. never ending circle. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's all of it, but I think that's part of it, mm -hmm. isn't it? I think it's part of it, yeah. Yeah. Well, are we corrupting that peace with our sinful self? 
So he's not endorsing modernity in that sense wholeheartedly. He's just saying that the core of it, the initial impulse, came out of the, fa the influence of the gospel in the West. And, and of course, we're going to get to that that creates the unity of the West. But uh, he, he's just saying that just because this is the part of the world where the gospel went first and has had the longest time to kind of percolate through and, and transform people's uh, uh, perspectives that inevitably it led people into, out from under these kind of rigid structures like ancient Egypt, or I mean, it, where, where is, this, is, this world is just given and there is, there's some, somebody up there, it's your ancestors or the gods or God or whatever, and what you have here is just what's given and we have to live in that. Uh, and uh, uh, there is a sense, in other words, modernity is, is a perversion of Christian freedom. The freedom that we have in Christ to live for the neighbor and instead of going through the cross and getting it from the word, what we, we still, we, now we know about freedom, we just grab it for ourselves. So freedom becomes emancipation. But there's also still something really good and right that we don't want to give up there in modernity, in other words. In other words, it's ambiguous. There's something really good about this drive toward autonomy. There's a truth at the heart of it. And we know how, what awful things it's led to as well. But there's a truth there. And that truth can be traced back to this influence of the gospel in Western culture over 2,000 years. That's what he's saying. Right. To all, right. And eliminates the second <laughs> and eliminates the second statement instead of holding it in paradox. Or tries to hold them together and can't. Yeah. Because if you look, if you look at somebody like Grotius, or you look at somebody like uh, Kant, he wanted us, he wanted people to be the servant of all. I mean, the categorical imperative means that. Yeah. You would only follow this rule if you could if you could will that everybody did it, you know. And he talked about you don't treat people as means but as ends. I mean, so he's he's drawing on all this Christian stuff, but trying to do it in a way that avoids the the cross. Um, and and uh, so I mean, th th this this seed is planted and it can't we can't go past it. I mean. People know about freedom. So I think your, your citation from Freedom of the Christian is good. It's just that it's going to go one way or the other. Uh, and, and we know, of course, that a, apart from the gospel, uh, that it's going to mean slavery ultimately for everybody. Uh, but uh, um, this idea is planted. And we, now we can't go back behind it. So the, the, the cat is out of the bag. Not, at first in, in West, Western Europe and its extensions like North America, now it's spreading all over the world. Yeah, we can't go back to the medieval. We can't go back. No, we can't go back. Spreading in the Eastern Church during the same time period? That's interesting. We'll get to that. No, the answer, actually, no, it's not happening. It's just in the West. Das Abendland in German. Isn't that the strange? Das Abendland. It's the evening land. That's the West. <laughs> I know, we're the sunset land. I always thought that was an odd name, but that's, that's, that's what they call it. Um, 
But that's, yeah, that's my next turn here. See, the, the tension between the ultimate and penultimate was preserved in the West. Certainly not, but I mean, it was preserved better in the West. There are many places where that was lost, of course, many times and places. So God, what God did, according to Bonhoeffer here, is he took the Greco-Roman antiquity, the world of Greco-Roman antiquity, and used it to spread the Christian message. But the gospel was always in tension with the culture that carried it. Um, this is, again, very difficult stuff. But the gospel affirms culture and the cross judges it. The incarnation. Right. The incarnation, I'm sorry, affirms culture and the cross judges it. And in Western Europe, the incarnation tended to prevail. That's like in England and in France and the Netherlands, and though that's what he means by Western, far Western Europe. Uh, the incarnation, yeah, who does Christ, Christmas better than the British, the English, you know, not the Scot, but I mean the British, or the English. Um, uh, leading to reconciliation with culture and a synthesis of the culture and the gospel. That's also in Southern Europe, like, Italy, you know, Roman Catholic and so on. Uh, um, and certainly in England. Um, in Germany, the cross tended to prevail, leading to an opposition between the culture and the gospel. This is broad generalities he's talking in now. So you have all these kind of revolutionary movements in Germany over the centuries, um, and then revolutionary mo movements in uh, thought in the 19th century. But it is the tension itself that is the source of true worldliness, which prevents the world and its history from becoming either sacralized or demonized. So um, uh, whenever the tension is lost, as I said, history, the world and its history becomes, uh, it's, it's just either all, it's the devil's world, we gotta withdraw, you know, like the sects, you know, the Anabaptists and others, right? Or it's, um, here's where the real action is, folks, and we got to get in here and we've got to make God's kingdom come. So that's the traditional uh, temptation of the reformed. We got to shape society according to God's will, right? So uh, the church, in a sense, you had <laughs> the original uh, theocracy in Geneva and you had it in New England as well, the attempt to shape all of society, and we live with, the, with that heritage very much from the Reformed heritage, where, society, where history tends to become sacred. Huh? And, uh, and now that's not happening in America anymore, and, or, or it happen, it's happening in secular ways, you know, because we all want to be on the, you know, riding the wave of history. You know, and now people are telling us that if we are in the, um, uh, you know, on the cusp of, of, of the sexual revolution, this is the wave of history, right? So, so they're, they're, um, then history becomes sacred again. But if we keep the tension, and this is why we need what, what, what Lene was talking about, it's why we need the witness that we're talking about here of the cross and the theology of the cross. Um, when, when that tension is kept, that is when the gospel is rightly preached so that these things are kept distinct from one another but related in Christ as they really are, then history comes into its own as the arena where we shape the future for the sake of our neighbor. That's, that's, that's a Bonhoeffer's ethic. And, and a, what you're saying is that apart from that tension, right. then, uh, one of two things happens, yeah. uh, maybe more, but at least these two. Either, uh, either uh, we become just pure culture products of this one. Right. No difference, right. My Christian faith in the culture. Right. Or I become uh, sectarian, I become separatist right. from the culture. So, 
yeah, yeah. You either, you either sacralize it, you can do that with compromise or revolution, huh? Yeah. So you could have a sexual revolution, you have a communist resolution, you could have whatever, and then history becomes sacred, or else you have this withdrawal, and it's, then it becomes demonized. Both are wrong, because both are, both are going to, uh, uh, see, both are ways of trying to exercise that freedom that we could only have in the gospel, in ways that are, are tyrannical and world-hating. So, um, this is an interesting point that he makes here now. Um, the Pope back in 1077 in Canossa. And Betka is right there, close by Canossa, where this happened. And this calls this to mind in that one letter. He's writing to Betka, and Betka's with the German army, you know, and they're retreating north up the Italian peninsula. Um, and he says, what happened there in 1077 was a crucial moment uh, in the development of intellectual freedom that made the West great. What happened there? Huh? What happened there? Pope um, uh, Gregory uh, VII had fled to that castle. There's a castle there in Canossa. Um, and uh, the um, Holy Roman Emperor, who was Henry IV, who was German, uh, was in a bad situation. Uh, he, he had historically had the, the right to um, invest bishops to give them the crozier, the sign of their office, as a sign, you know, uh, uh, so, so that, you know, there was this complete integration of church and state. And the Pope said, you can't do that. The bishops aren't under you, emperor. They're under me. <laughs> okay. So, um, and, the, and he was, and, and, and uh, because uh, Henry IV defied Gregory, Gregory excommunicated him. Well, it turned out that uh, uh, Henry didn't have a lot of support. He was always trying to keep the nobles down so he could, you know, unite Germany into one nation, and he, and he was up against it, and he, and, and, uh, he was losing his... his uh, support because he was excommunicated. So, I mean, he, he had no legitimacy. So what did he do? He crosses the Alps in the winter. He stands outside of Canossa, and the Pope keeps him we, we, waiting for, I don't know, a week. He's barefoot as a penitent, <laughs> approaching the Pope, and asks for, um, for being reinstated, for being forgiven, reinstated into the church, which he finally did. But he made, the Pope made him stay out there. Um, and, um, and, and, uh, and this is a story that's usually told as a great tragedy because, you know, this was part of the humiliation of Germany by the Italians and, 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 and prevented Germany from uniting and becoming a great nation like, like France and like England and, and why Germany was so you know, so backward and disunited, and it was a terrible shame. And Bonhoeffer is saying, no, this was a great moment in Western history. Um, why is that? Because um, he said, the symbols of the bishops, crozier, and the ring are not adiaphora. He brings up that word adiaphora there. Um, if the state can order the internal life of the church, then the state can uh, claim divine prerogatives and the tension between church and state between the gospel and the culture is lost. And both the gospel and the world in its reality as God's world are lost. What he's saying here is that the church maintained its independence over and against the state. So that there was something different. Um, the, 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 in, in a sense, the, the gospel didn't simply become the tool of these rulers to maintain the status quo or 
consolidate their power. The gospel was still a word that was being spoken from outside of history and thereby um, brought history and made it truly temporal, truly human, truly um, uh, uh, limited the power of the state and the power of any in human institution. And that happened uniquely in the West. Now what happened in the East? There's Eastern Christendom too. There's Constantinople and Russia, Moscow, or St. Petersburg later. What's going on there? Well, there the emperor, the there was no the distinction. The, the, the church is a department of the state. That's it. Yeah. And the church, the, the gospel becomes almost entirely an interior mystical kind of thing. No. And so history becomes sacred. <laughs> it becomes, you know, what is, is God's sacred order. But in the West, that, we, they could never quite settle down to that because the tension still was there all the way through. That's what Bonhoeffer is saying here. And he sees this as emblematic. Not that that particular uh, event was the actual cause of this, but it became such a, a, an immense symbol a, a, and a powerful symbol that was there always. Well, there's the emperor, you know, in the snow and barefoot, humbling himself in front of the pope. Right, and, and, and you find it all over the place yeah. in, in American history, own, right. Or, yeah, yeah. You do, but, but, but the defining version is the New England version, the original Puritan version, I think, for American religion. And that is that uh, there is this kind of synthesis between the church and the state, and, uh, and then it's very strange that kind of imposed on that is freedom of religion in the late 18th century, although it took a while before the, all the churches were, were um, uh, uh, disestablished. But the, the most basic thing that he's getting at here is this idea of becoming truly temporal, truly finite, being drawn into your skin. You know, simply living in responsibility to your neighbor so that uh, um, uh, um, what you do in your day-to-day -day life is It's, it's, it's hard to explain. It's, 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 you're not trying to bring in the kingdom. You're not trying to make yourself righteous. You're not trying to justify yourself or justifying the system that you live under, the political system or social system or whatever. Um, it is simply this arena of service. Then that idea is always there and it doesn't go away. And uh, that's what Bonhoeffer is saying. It wasn't adiaphora who gives the crozier and the ring to the bishop. You know what adiaphora is? No, that's not what adiaphora is. No, it's not things that don't matter. Ad <laughs> that's such a slippery concept. Adiaphora are things that are neither commanded nor forbidden by, by God's word neither commanded nor forbidden. But we know also from Lutheran history, right, and from our confessions that when are adiaphora not adiaphora? When they're commanded. Yeah. When they're commanded. <laughs> yeah, or forbidden. Right. Then we have, to, we have to refuse, and it's a matter of confession, to refuse to accept 
either a command or a prohibition. Yes, I can't accept that, and I, I, I reject that utterly. Because why? Because you're you're because you're saying that's necessary for 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 our unity in the church and for being the church. And what is only necessary for the church? It's it's Christ Himself. It's what He has done. And 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 uh, and we're we're adding something to Christ then. Uh, as Napoleon. Oh, Napoleon. Yeah, he was the, the modern guy. He uh, grabbed it from the Pope and put it on his head. <laughs> Charlemagne kind of forced the Pope to do it in 800, Christmas Day of 800. Uh, he didn't really want to, um, but he, he founded the Holy <laughs> Roman Empire, which was always a contradiction in terms. Uh, but... Um, nor Roman, nor an empire. It was not, none of the three. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, Claude, you have something? Oh, I thought you were, sure. Okay, sure, yeah. No, I thought, uh, Claude, you kind of leaned over and I thought you were ready to say something. That's fine. He just stepped out. <laughs> 